Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tolman. Welcome back, everyone, to Talk Dizzy to Me. My name is Dr. Abby Ross, vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist, joined, as always, by Dr. Danny Tolman, another vestibular physical therapist and what we call vestibuloholic. And today we're joined by, once again, Dr. Jeff Walter, a vestibular physical therapist out of Pennsylvania. And we're here today to discuss part two of atypical BPPB. We didn't get through everything in our first episode, but today we have a lot more to share of what you might see more on a rare occasion in the clinic. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks. Happy to be here. Um, I would recommend if you did not listen to the first episode that perhaps you listen to that episode before this episode uh, in that order. So there was a part one to this um, lecture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. Uh, we, we got to the end of that lecture and there was just still so much that we wanted to talk about. Um, so let's just dive right in. I think one of the things that we didn't get into in our last episode were canalith jams. Could you tell us a little bit about canal jams and how they happen and what we might see if somebody has a canalith jam? Sure. Uh, this is really an interesting concept. So most of the literature, in fact, I'm, I think almost all the literature is on the concept of having um, an a an otoconial jam, so that's debris that gets lodged into your horizontal canal. Theoretically, either a large bolus of debris getting entrapped in the canal, or you have some debris that gets entrapped in a narrow portion of your semicircular canal. Um, It could probably happen in any canal, including the posterior canal, but there's not a lot of literature on what to expect when that happens. But there's evolving literature on what to expect when it happens in the horizontal canal. Um, I've seen several cases of this. Patients are typically very impaired when they have it. Um, the, so that's the logic behind it is the debris is not free floating in the canal, but in, entrapped in the canal, but lodged in the canal and not free floating. So if you look at the literature and just from personal experience, the things you may see with this, it really presents very similar to a, to a unilateral vestibular loss. So there's some literature supporting Um, reduced gain in your vestibular ocular reflex that can result in a positive head impulse test towards the involved side. So that's one feature you may see. They can often have spontaneous nystagmus um, that's unidirectional, regardless as to whether to where the patient's gazing. So for example, you have right beat with primary gaze, right gaze, and left gaze. So a unidirectional nystagmus. There is some debate about whether the nystagmus tends to be irritative or paretic. So that's not completely clear. And it may depend on where in the horizontal canal the debris is occluded. So there's still some debate about that. And that unidirectional nystagmus that you see can be present when you're doing positioning tests. I know probably if I go back eight years and before my career, whenever we saw in the clinic direction fixed positional nystagmus, I would always tell a student or an intern, well, you can almost be assured that that's not BPPV when you see that. And I sort of changed my tune on that. I mean, it's not usually BPPV, but it could be. Um, So those are some of the features that have been reported. Also caloric weakness when debris actively lodged in the canal has been reported that's reversible when the debris um, theoretically comes loose. So one thing I've learned is when you see a presentation that looks like unilateral vestibular loss, I routinely now do repeated roll tests. And I also do repeated roll tests with vibration of the skull to give that patient a chance for the debris, if debris is creating that presentation, to give it a chance to express itself as such. So that's one change you might want to make in your clinical practice is when you see patients with unilateral loss, to repeated roll testing with vibration in both the right ear uh, dependent position and left ear dependent position and repeat it several times and just see if it changes or converts at all um, during that. Um, I think historically too, I've seen some patients that have presented with what looked to me to be unilateral vestibular loss. And they're, they're pretty acute and we may give them steroids and maybe just some beginner 
compensation exercises the first visit and I have them come back five days later to re-examine them and with the thoughts of enhancing their home exercise program and monitoring their progress and they come back and they're totally fine with no evidence of unilateral loss. And so I think some of those patients in retrospect probably had debris wadded up in their canal, came loose, migrated out of the canal. Now they look, there's no evidence of unilateral loss in that patient five days later, which would be hard hard to fathom if they really had like a vestibular neuritis. So that's some of my experience with it. It's really interesting when you see those cases. I've struggled to videotape them because they look like unilateral vestibular loss patients. And I'm like, well, this isn't that exciting because I have tons of video of that. And then by the time you figure out that it's it was a debris plug in their canal, you've already sort of fixed it. And you, I haven't I haven't really been able to record these cases yet. So I need to probably more routinely start recording the unilateral loss cases in, in case they evolve into these canal plugging cases. Now, do these patients, will they have a history that sounds like they had some BPV going on prior to their symptoms coming on? You would think about, that's a good point. I would think about this more. So that's a good point. Do they have a prior history of positional vertigo? Because we know BPV can recur. Think about the demographic of your patient. I mean, if it's a 28-year-old with no head trauma and was ill the week before with an upper respiratory infection, neuritis is much more likely. If it's a 82-year-old that noticed it upon arising from bed and has a prior history of what sounds like classic BPPV, or if you've seen the patient with BPPV previously, you know, I would think a lot more about the possibility of canal canal occlusion being the, the possible etiology. Now, we talked about how we know the vestibular apparatus is tiny, right? And the canals are tiny and the otoconia are tiny. So it's hard for me to even picture how these otoconia get jammed. Can you talk a little bit about the diameter of sure. a canal so we can picture that? Yeah. So there's the literature varies a little bit. And the, the diameter of the sem membrane of semicircular canal is not completely uniform. So I'm giving you generalities here. The membranous canal is about 0.25 millimeters. So it's sub millimeter. You got to keep that in mind. <clears throat> the bony canal, by the way, that protects your membranous canal is 10 times larger. There's a lot of anat anatomical slides that are really misleading that make it look like the membranous canal takes up almost all the space provided by the bony canal. And that's just simply not true. So you got to remember these are capillary sized vessels, the membranous canals. Debris ranges in size like one otoconia is somewhere between five microns and 35, 50 microns. Um, but we know BPPV is not caused by a particle or two or three. It's a cluster of particles. So you have to keep that in mind that BPPV, we think, is a cluster of particles that's reached a critical mass causing um, a significant enough flow in the canal to create symptoms. Um, so I think you need to keep in mind it's a cluster. We're talking about a capillary sized vessel. So I think that's how you can envision how it could happen. And, and again, the canal diameter is not uniform. So you could have an area that's narrowed up and that cluster of debris gets entrapped in there. There's some literature that shows that um, with crystals that come off, so does the, the um, gelatinous membrane that the crystals sit on. So you can have a big bolus of debris just because of the whole macular um, uh uh, gelatinous membrane that you know comes off the utricle as well. Right. There was a, I can't remember the lead author, but I know one of the authors is Parnes on the study that was fairly recent that shows, that shows the photographic evidence of the debris being harvested from the canal. I know when I looked at the pictures from that study, I was counting the number of otoconia that they extracted from, these were patients that were undergoing, I believe, um, laparinfectomy for Meniere's and they also had BPPV so they could kind of do whatever they wanted with their ear because they were sacrificing it to abolish their vestibular function. And they harvested the actual debris out of their canal. When you look at the photos, I remember counting the number of individual particles and I stopped at like 70. So again, I think if you're over the age of 60 and we probably got a microscope and looked in your canal, probably almost all of us have a microscopic amount of otoconia in our canal, but it's just not at a threshold that creates enough turbulent flow for us to sense. Now, this next question is from my own personal clinical experience, but 
Um, have you seen ca uh, canal jams happen following uh, cantaloupe repositioning maneuvers? Hmm. I can't recall that I have all the cases I've seen where I've suspected canal jam that came in with it. I've had, I'll just say that I've had one instance, uh, and I, I found this when I went back to review some literature um, where this can happen, but I found that uh, I had a patient that came in with horizontal canal beep and BV. We did our goofoni, and he needed to finish up some paperwork. And I wanted him to sit a little while before he left anyways. So um, everything seemed okay. I gave him some paperwork. He was sitting out in the waiting room and um, was going to check in with me before he left. And when I went to go check on him, he was sweating profusely, all of a sudden developed this new onset of just constant room spinning vertigo. Um, wasn't feeling very well at all. He's like, I actually think I feel worse. So I brought him back. We got goggles on him and he had that, you know, third degree spontaneous nystagmus. Um, we, I did a repositioning maneuver again with vibration. It cleared up instantly and it was gone before he walked out the door. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is some instances, I suppose, or I guess, um, especially that they found in this one study that I, I was looking at where doing canal of repositioning maneuvers can cause a canal of jam potentially, um, which is what I think I saw that day. So. Yeah, that's possible. So let's talk a little bit more about when we do the repeated position testing role testing, what, what is our goal with that? What are we looking for? Well, I think one thing with doing the repeated positioning test is you're giving the opportunity for gravity to free up the debris to migrate. And you want to, the problem is we don't know when you see a patient, you don't know where exactly it would be lodged in the horizontal semicircular canal. So that's why when I do roll tests, I might go 90 degrees, right? 90 degrees left, 45 degrees, right? 45 degrees left, just giving gravity a chance to free that debris up and then adding vibration to it, thinking just logically the vibratory forces would help jostle the debris loose. Um, but that's just a thought on what to do when you see this. If you can free it and, and it converts into your classic geotropic horizontal canal canalothiasis, then we would then proceed to Caffoni's maneuver and then let the patient sit for a while. And then the head impulse test should clean up. And also if you let them sit long enough, the spontaneous unidirectional nystagmus should clean up. Nice. So those are things you want to see. Good. So is there anything else that we want to touch on with canal jam? Do you think there's any, anything, any additional information that we need to discuss? Now, there's a recent article by Schubert on this con on this um, topic. I think it's free access, if I remember right. So Michael Schubert, who a lot of you are probably familiar with, uh, S-C-H-U-B-E-R-T, um, had a recent paper on Canal Jam that you might want to look at. I think it was 2021, if I remember right. That talks about several cases and what the theoretical basis behind it and a little bit of literature review on what we know about it. So, Perfect. Um, listeners All right, may let's, win. So. let's move on from canal jams to another C word, conversions. Take it away. Sure. Um, I think the most common conversion you'll see as a therapist is if you're treating posterior canal BPV, you know, there's always debate about how many maneuvers we should do. And there's pros and cons to doing repeated maneuvers versus one maneuver and whether you have goggles or not to track whether your maneuver appears to be effective. But if you're doing repeated uh, modified Epley's maneuvers or canal reposition maneuvers for posterior canal canalothiasis, if you see enough patients, you'll definitely have the experience of when you drop a patient back for a <clears throat> for a retest and retrospect that they did not need, the debris can go from the utricle into the horizontal canal. It'll coincide with your patient feeling markedly worse. Um, the nystagmus will be brisk and geotropic when it occurs towards the dependent ear. So you need to be aware of that conversion. So that's the debris migrated from the posterior canal back to the utricle. You did a repeated test. You put the horizontal canal dependent and the debris went from the utricle into the horizontal canal. If that happens, you kind of have two choices. I would just elevate the patient's head as soon as you see it start. As soon as I see that start, I bring my patient's head up. Like if I'm back in a right 
right ear dependent position and I've been treating the right ear and I see that we have this horizontal canal conversion, I just now lift the head up, wait for it to calm down. And then just from that supine position, I'll just do a supine log roll treatment. You could also sit the patient up and do a Gaffoni's maneuver. I think they both work fine. And if you look at the spatial orientation of the ear involved with each maneuver, I think that either one would work. Um, I just found that to be more tolerable for the patient. The other thing is we're keeping the debris in the back arm of the horizontal canal by keeping them back and doing a supine log roll treatment. So when you sit them up, especially let them bring their head forward, you might have the debris end up in the front arm of the horizontal canal, and you don't want that to happen um, because Gaffoni's maneuver and the supine log roll treatment um, really work best if the debris is in the back arm of the canal, not the front arm of the horizontal canal. So that's how I would react to that conversion. The other conversion that occurs, we mentioned this in the prior podcast on this subject, but when you're treating posterior canal BPPV in modified Epley's position number three, where the nose is down towards the ground, you can have debris transiently migrate from the posterior canal into the anterior canal, and you sit the patient up and you get that real strong screaming, falling response from the patient. So that's a canal conversion to be aware of. Um, others that I'm trying to think of. How about horizontal canal to cupula or cupula to canal? Oh, definitely. So the goal of treatment of with cupulolithiasis of the horizontal canal is to convert it to canalithiasis. So we're not really converting it to a different canal, but you're converting it from cupulolithiasis to canalithiasis. Um, definite, I mean, that's really the goal of the treatment with that. So certainly those sort of transitions can occur. Um, those about, would be the main conversions that I would see. What about, so you had talked about how otoconia can transiently go into the anterior portion of the canal in the third position of the epley. What if you've got um, debris falling from the posterior canal, the common crew down into the utricle? Can it pass by that horizontal canal and transiently dip into that at all, causing a burst of horizontal canal nystagmus um, when you sit a patient back up from repositioning maneuvers or not so much? I don't think that's, I don't believe that's anatomically possible. Okay. All right. Um, I think that uh, what, if you are a clinician who um, does repeat testing at their um, clinic, that it's also worth telling the patient that there's a potential that they might feel this or feel worse. If we go to retest and it feels significantly worse, this is okay. This is something that we know might happen and we can fix it. Warn the patient so they don't panic uh, for sure. Absolutely. That is great advice. And I always hammer that home to students is if you're going to do something that might make a patient feel worse, the patient loses a lot of stock in you. If you gave them no warning, if you gave them no education on that possibility, so I think that's really wise advice, Danielle, to before, whenever I do a retest on a patient, I always tell them when we come back, it may be completely gone, which would be swell. That'd be great. It could be the same. And that means we have more work to do. There is a small chance when I put you back that it could feel substantially worse. If that happens, we can typically take care of that. So just that's the standard instructions whenever I do a retest with a patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Helps to build that rapport. Now, while we're on horizontal, can we get a little bit into the Kim maneuver? When might we use it and what do we do to perform it? Sure. Um, this was published in 2012, I believe out of South Korea. Um, so just briefly, the diagnostic criteria for cupulolithiasis of the horizontal canal, we're looking at when you do supine roll testing, you have a persistent ageotropic or apogeotropic nystagmus. That's nystagmus beating away from the ground. So remember, geo is ground, trophic is affinity, um, and a is away or apo is away. So we have nystagmus beating away from the ground in direction. And what gets confusing with horizontal canal cupulolithiasis is the nystagmus created by debris entrapped on your cupula in your horizontal canal is excitatory when your healthy ear is down. So the nystagmus should be substantially stronger when the healthy ear is towards the earth. So if the left ear is involved, we'd see stronger nystagmus with the right ear dependent. So when you're diagnosing it, you'd really like to see that there's a marked asymmetry in the intensity of nystagmus with roll testing with 
the nystagmus being more intense to the uninvolved ear, when the uninvolved ear is down. Another really helpful test in that subject is I would recommend doing bow and lean testing. So when we bow a patient's head forward, the nystagmus should be away from the affected side in a sustained manner. And when we tilt the patient's head back, it should be the excitatory nystagmus beating to the involved ear when the nose is towards the ceiling. By the way, angulation on that, remember your, third, your canals sit 30 degrees up. Uh, the front end sits higher than the back end, your horizontal canal. So you should want to flex your patient's head down 120 degrees to get the canal perfectly aligned with gravity. So the bow should be 120 down and the lean only needs to be 60 back to get the canal aligned with gravity for your bow and lean test. So we would like to treat, just to simplify things, when the patient's nose is towards the ceiling, you want to see nystagmus, the nystagmus should be beating to the involved ear. And you can also just see this on supine positioning. If you just position your patient supine, you can see nystagmus beating to the involved ear. If it's cupulolithiasis. Correct. Those so rules stuff. change for, cantalith for cantalithiasis. You can reverse everything I just said about the bow and lean test. It behaves in the exact opposite manner. It'll be to the affected side when you lean forward. Um, so Kim's maneuver, like I said, was published about 10 years ago. And I remember reading it about it. And I was like, eh, I don't, I kind of read halfway through it. It was sitting on my desk and I kind of spaced out and I wasn't sure about it. And I had a patient with cupulolithiasis of the horizontal canal. And I was trying all my traditional treatments of rolling the patient's head back and forth, doing sit to sideline maneuvers, trying to jar the debris loose. And nothing worked on the patient in the first visit. This was like an 80 year old female. And I said, we'll come back in 10 days and we'll look at it again. And, and I still hadn't read the article completely. So I came back and I still remember this. The lady said to me, well, so I explained to her exactly what was going on. And she had done some research on her own when she was gone. When she came back, she said, why didn't you try that treatment by Kim? That was just probably <laughs> 12. And I was like, well, it's funny you say that because it's on my desk. And so I sat I, in the office while she was there. I sat and read the rest of the study and I tried it on her and, I, and it worked. And I and she left and I'm like, boy, do I feel like a doofus. An 82 year old just dictated her care to me. And she was right <laughs> about what I should have tried. But anyhow, the maneuver involves, you need, you need to be able to vibrate the patient's skull. What frequency you need to vibrate the patient's skull is still debatable. We know for mastoid vibration testing that it should be 100 hertz, but to liberate debris from cupulas, we don't really know. So the patient's nose should be, if you're treating a left side, uh, oh good, we have a uh, illustration of it. Let me see what side's being treated. This go. is a wrong side of treatment. So if you're on YouTube or you can see images, it would be helpful for this. But you end up, start, you start with your patient on their involved side, on their side, with their nose down towards the ground, not completely down towards the ground, about a 45 degree angle off the ground. And we vibrate um, just the bone right behind your mastoid area uh, of the involved ear. In their study, they talked about holding these positions, I believe three minutes each. I don't do that, but if you want to follow what they wrote, that's what they wrote. So you vibrate in that first position with the nose down towards the ground, about 45 degrees away from the ground. For I usually do it for about two minutes, and I do it at, I keep changing the um, vibratory frequency on my vibrator just to kind of cover all the spectrums of vibration because i don't know if it's low vibrate low frequency or high frequency stimuli that would help the debris depart from the cupula but i'll try both because i don't think that would hurt the next step is is you're, you're every step from here on out you're moving the nose you're rotating the nose away from the involved side so in the second position, the nose ends up just being parallel with the ground. So if you're in, a, in an office, the patient's nose would be pointing out the window, for example, if there's a window on your wall. So the head's kind of parallel with the ground. So we turned it, if you're treating a right side, you would turn it 45 degrees to the left. Here's what I found to be a really helpful marker is when you roll the patient over to their back, which is the next step, their nose goes towards the ceiling. If you're treating a right side, 
you want to see a strong burst of left beating. The nystagmus with this maneuver, if effective, should be all, we're talking about a right side, it should be all left beating throughout the maneuver. So when you roll the patient to their back, if they get a real, they usually don't like it. They should get a strong, if you liberated the debris and it's loose in the canal now, when you roll them to their back, if you're treating a right side, they get a strong burst of left beating that stops. That's a nice marker that the maneuver worked. And then you let that settle down. Each of these positions, like I said, they said two to three minutes. I'm more like one minute, except when I'm doing the vibration in the first step. And then your next step is you roll the patient onto their left side, right? And now their nose is 90 degrees, in this case, to their left. And you should see, here's your other marker, whether it worked or not. You should see a burst of geotropic nystagmus now if the debris is loose. So if you have a burst of geotropic nystagmus that then stops, you can put your vibrator away. You don't need it anymore, all right? In that position, if you still see ageotropic nystagmus, it's advisable to vibrate again. One issue with horizontal canal cupulolithiasis is, is you don't know what side of the cupula the debris stuck on. We think, and there's some literature that suggests about three quarters of the time it's caught on the canal side of the cupula, not the utricular side. But this second vibratory position would seemingly be more helpful if the debris was on the utricular side. But it's a second position you would vibrate in, but you only vibrate if it's still persistent ageotropic nystagmus. And then you finish with the nose down to the ground. If you look at the two positions, they're the same, basically the same positions as a Gaffoni's maneuver for cantalithiasis, the last two positions. And then you sit the patient up from that position. So what you're looking for with the maneuvers, you want to, here's a, maybe a new term for you. You want geotropization of the nystagmus. So we want to convert the nystagmus from being ageotropic to geotropic. And that process is called geotropization. That's what I'll write in my notes if that happened during the maneuver, because that just succinctly describes what happened. Now, uh, how important, I mean, I know that this is part of the maneuver, this is the way it was tested, but how important is the vibration in that first position? I think it's, very, I think it's critical to, to the success of the maneuver. Mm -hmm. I've used a lot of different maneuvers for horizontal canal cupulolithiasis, and I've never been real impressed with any of them. But this one seems to work the best, but it still isn't. Don't leave here thinking it's 100%. A big issue is for horizontal canal cantalithiasis, the diagnostic criteria are very clear. And if you have a patient who has bursts of geotropic nystagmus with supine roll testing, they almost, there's not much else on the differential. But not all subjects with ageotropic or apogeotropic positional nystagmus have cupulolithiasis. That's one thing I want to drive home. So one thing that muddies up the waters here is I think I'm doing this maneuver sometimes on patients that don't really have cupulolithiasis of their horizontal canal because you can have ageotropic nystagmus with cerebellar degeneration. We can see ageotropic positional nystagmus just as patients age, and it doesn't seem real clinically significant. So it can be a little hard to sort out who definitely has debris on their cupula that we're doing the maneuver to. So it kind of clouds how well the maneuver works. I will say that when I do it in patients, who have an established documented history of BPD at our center, it works much better than when I'm doing it on a patient who I've never seen before with BPPV. So part of the issue with determining how well the maneuver works is really knowing for sure that that's why your patient has ageotropic nystagmus, that debris is the creator of that. So I think it works well when you get down to patients who clearly, clearly have BPV. I would say about 70% in one visit but sometimes you just can't get the debris loose. Now, if they, if somebody doesn't have a um, tool that they can vibrate with, do you have another go-to maneuver that you could recommend? Not really. I mean, I would probably recommend doing Brant Daroff type movements to putting with no rotation of the skull. So just having your patient basically treat their head like a windshield wiper down to the bed and back up to the involved side. Um, they could do, if they have trouble moving that way, maybe a safer thing to do is in bed supine 
rapidly roll their head through their comfortable range of motion, basically doing a supine roll test repeatedly. Um, those would be some things I would try. You got to be a little careful, though, because if the patient is successful in converting their cupulolithiasis to canalithiasis at home, they could potentially feel worse. <laughs> So you gotta be a little careful about giving somebody something to do at home that converts it from cupulolithiasis to canalithiasis because their symptom intensity may increase when that happens. We know from modeling that if you take a debris of a fixed mass and you place it on a cupula versus free floating in the narrow portion, the narrow center portion of their membranous canal, there is more pressure created by moving debris than debris caught on the cupula. So typically we see nystagmus that's weaker with cupulolithiasis and stronger with canalithiasis. With canalithiasis, it lasts seconds and cupulolithiasis, it's persistent. But some patients may be bothered by the fact that you gave them an exercise that made their vertigo more intense to do at home. And then they're kind of caught at home in that state until they see you. I, um, I had a recent uh, inquiry from a clinic up in New Jersey who didn't have the um, vibration tool yet. Um, and we did some research together and we found a maneuver that actually worked for for them in that instance, which I'll share real quick. Um, it was from a, a recent study um, by Zuma. And it looked like it's similar to some of these canal through positioning maneuvers with um, kind of like the, uh, the idea of a cement where you use a brisk uh, deceleration to bring them down to the involved side, it looks like. Um, into sideline. So you do a quick uh, movement down to their involved side, hoping to detach the otoconia from the cupula, it looks like. And then assuming that it's going to be in that um, front portion of the horizontal canal, then you turn the head up and then kind of finish out that log roll type of maneuver there. But um, this would just be an example of, you know, maybe if uh, something you can try in your clinic with the patient before sending them home with m maneuvers too, if you don't have a vibration tool. And, and thankfully it worked for them. They were able to convert it in one try and get that patient feeling better. Um, but there are a couple other little options out there. That's one thing. If you look through the literature, there's so many different maneuvers that people have developed over time that, you know, I'm sure it's worked in one, one sense or another, but this would just be another example of that. If you guys are watching on YouTube, there's a yeah. little explanation yeah. of it. I think this makes sense. Um, just if you're looking, watching on YouTube, just so you don't get confused you're going counterclockwise with the illustration here. Yes, good point. <laughs> with the illustration, that's the order. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. That's basically, it gets really confusing in the literature, but there's two different Gaffoni maneuvers and that kind of combines both of them in a way. There's a mm -hmm. uh, Gaffoni's maneuver for the um, debris being entrapped in the anterior portion of the horizontal canal. And then there's uh, a better known Gaffoni's maneuver for the debris being in the back part of the horizontal canal. And it kind of combines both of those first getting the debris from the front part of the canal to the back part of the canal, and then getting it from the back part of the canal to the utricle. So okay. that would make some sense if you don't have the ability to do Kim's maneuver. Good. So now let's talk a little bit about the rare occasion that you might see multi-canal involvement. So can we ever see a patient with posterior canal thiasis in both ears? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's actually, I think, pretty common. Uh, so I've been amazed at how often I see a patient back for a return visit. I thought their first maneuver went by the book and they come back and they're still symptomatic. And I'm a little surprised that they're not better. And I go to test them and the, the side that was involved at their first visit's fine. And they happen to show you that they have BPV on their contralateral side. Um, so the literature, in my personal experience, I think it's at least 10% of patients have it bilaterally. And the, the most common multi-canal presentation would be bilateral posterior canal involvement. So and really, really at that first visit, check both canals repeatedly and check it well. I usually go to what is the proposed uninvolved side first, if you can tell from the history that one side might be involved more than the other. And I'll do at least two loaded Dix Hall pikes to the uninvolved side first, just so I can feel good about clearing that and then go to the to what is the proposed involved side second, just so you know what you're dealing with. But it, I think it's really common. Um, if you encounter that, I would recommend you treat if the patient wants to try to tackle both in one session and you're experienced and you have goggles, I think it's reasonable to try to treat both in one day. I would treat the less involved side first 
and then the more involved side second, there's a little bit of a risk when you do the maneuvers to that second side of undoing your work from the prior ear. But if you're going to undo something, undo the lighter side. So that's why I treat the stronger side second. Um, if a patient, if their tolerance to treatment's really limited, you might just want to treat their more involved side and leave the other side alone and just tell them, well, you have it over there too, but I left it alone today because the primary issue seems to be your right side. We'll tackle your left side when you come back. That's perfectly reasonable too. And I would say if you're not as experienced or don't have goggles, um, I would probably just treat the more involved side first and then treat the less involved side second, especially if your patient doesn't live far away from your clinic. You can, you certainly need to be more aware of multi-canal involvement with head trauma. That's the subset of patients where you're more likely to see multi-canal involvement. Um, you can certainly see a horizontal in a posterior canal. So you want to keep that in mind. If you do, I would recommend treating the posterior canal first and then using Gaffoni's maneuver for the horizontal canal because the advantage of that is you would not be, if the horizontal and the posterior are ipsilateral on the same side of the skull, when you do your Gaffoni's maneuver, you're not putting the involved ear dependent. So you theoretically wouldn't run a risk of undoing your modified epilis to that posterior canal. So I would treat the posterior canal first, horizontal canal second, if they're on the same side of the skull. If you have posterior canal on one side and a horizontal canal on the other, I would typically, usually the horizontal canal is what's bothering the patient more. I would just treat the horizontal canal in the first visit and typically leave the posterior canal alone um, because to do a gaffonies or a log roll treatment, you're going to have to put that in that involved posterior canal down to do the maneuver. So those are some of the common multi-canal cases that you see. Now, I, I want to touch on something which I think um, confuses some, some clinicians, and this is the central nervous system compensation nystagmus that you can see. Because I think sometimes uh, clinicians will see that and think there's multiple canal involvement. Could you touch a little bit on what that is? Yeah, that can really confuse you. Um, so I think you can really apply this to any vestibular special test you do, not just positioning tests. If you do a test that evokes really strong nystagmus, let's just say a real strong burst of right beating, you should go chill for a while and just let everything calm down because when you've had a protracted burst of nystagmus beating to the right, it does not take long at all for your central nervous system to generate a reaction to inhibit that. The issue is sometimes the stimuli like BPPV, the stimuli quickly fades that was creating that right beat, but here comes your compensation that's no longer needed. And your patient sits there and they go, they go through a second phase of left beat nystagmus, which we call short-term central nervous system compensation that's no longer needed. So the most common time you'll see it is if you do supine log roll testing, your patient has canalithiasis and you set off a, a wicked burst of geotropic nystagmus beating to the right. You haven't changed head positions at all and you're watching your video screen. And after that's done, you see the nystagmus reverses in direction to being left beat after you just witnessing that fat burst, strong burst of right beating. That's central nervous system compensation. So just let that completely calm down before you do anything else. But you should keep this in mind when you do other vestibular special tests. Like if you do a head shake test, and when you're done doing a head shake, a patient has a real strong burst of right beating. If you sit there for a little while, there can be a little null phase, and then it can go left without you even touching the patient. So if you jump right into your next test, like hyperventilation, you may see left beating with that next test because you didn't wait long enough for that whole phenomenon to play out. So I've just always learned if you see a strong burst of nystagmus that you provoked, if the patient's upright and you did a special test, let them relax for a while. Go document a note for two minutes. Just I just go start their note for two minutes. And I just wait for all that to calm down before I do anything else with them. And if you're doing positioning tests, you just got to wait for everything to calm down, including that compensatory phase. So it's this short-term central nervous system compensation is nystagmus directed in the opposite direction of what you just provoked. All right. And it's your brain trying to put out a fire that's no longer a flame. 
So it's, it's actually compensation that's no longer needed because the stimuli went away, but your brain had already started generating this compensation. So it's in the opposite direction of the nystagmus you evoked. Without having that concept in mind, when you see it, I remember, Danny, you saw a patient recently. When you see it, you're like, oh, what is happening here? Because it really does kind of shock you. You expect and see one thing, and then all of a sudden it completely reverses. Yeah, and patients can be symptomatic with it, too. Like they can have oscillopsy and be disturbed by it. Definitely something important to keep in mind. There's seems like there's a lot of things to keep in mind. And I think just uh, practicing and treating and just keep seeing this over and over and over again, things are going to start to fall into place and make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We see it more with horizontal canal BPPV. I don't see it as much with posterior canal BPV, but you can see a little bit if somebody has really strong canalithiasis, it plays out. You can see that they have just like this light delayed compensation after it, but it's much more apparent with horizontal canal stimulated nystagmus. Very nice. Anything else that we need to add to atypical BPPV or perhaps a little plug? You're looking for some staffing at your office. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking about that before the podcast. <laughs> it helped been hard to find. Um, but we'll stay away from that. I'm doing some courses, new courses that I'm recording for MedBridge in June. So they'll probably be out in the later part of summer on case studies, um, which kind of ties everything together. And actually this topic, atypical BPD, will go into more detail on different maneuvers and things that we do for atypical BPD. So I'm recording a couple of those. And there's, uh, that's, will be in addition to the 10 part course series I have on MedBridge, if anybody's interested. Um, that's about it. Just busy with research and super busy with clinical practice here at Geisinger. So you know, that's about it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I definitely can vouch for those MedBridge courses. If you haven't checked them out, check them out. They're really good. You'll learn a lot and they're not boring like a lot of courses are. They're engaging. There's videos associated. So certainly look into those if you haven't yet. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm sure we'll have you on again because you are indeed a fan favorite and always so knowledgeable. Thank you listeners for joining us as well. We'll see you next time. Thank Thanks, you. Abby. Thanks, Danielle. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPPV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Neck Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.